Praise the Lord. Welcome, welcome, welcome to PWLM Wednesday Night Bible Study. I'm Bishop James Manigault. So excited to have you on with us tonight. Come on in. Like, share this video as we begin to get started with our Bible study in about one minute. Amen. Praise the Lord, Sister Pam. Praise the Lord, Sister Lee. Amen, amen. Come on in, come on in. Again, welcome to PWLM. I'm Bishop James Manigault. So excited to have you on with us tonight as we begin our Bible study service. Amen. Listen, you don't want to miss this. We're going to be continuing our series, hallelujah, dealing with discernment and the need for understanding. You know, we talked about apostasy, but why we don't need to conform. Come on in. Again, like, share the video. We're starting now. We'll begin with a word of prayer and we'll dive right into the word. Let me know where you're coming from, that you're in watching and visiting with us as we get started. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, God, for this opportunity, God, to study. You said study to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Bring revelation, insight, wisdom, God, as we live, God, before you. As, Lord God, our desire is to be pleasing unto you. For you said there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end there is in destruction. God, give us ears to hear and the ability to act upon that that we hear. And we'll forever be mindful to give you the glory and the honor and the praise. 
In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Again, praise the Lord, Brother James. So excited to have you on with us tonight. Um, we will be in the building this coming Sabbath, praise the Lord, um, for those that will be coming out to fellowship with us. Again, that's on the 19th, Wednesday, uh, the 19th uh, of November. We will be inside of the building. I know that's before Thanksgiving. Um, we'll be celebrating what God is doing um, over here at PWLM. We welcome you to come out. Dynamic word for this coming uh, praise the Lord Saturday. You don't want to miss it. Um, again, had the privilege of, of, of fellowshipping with some very young, um, powerful entrepreneurs, young men. Um, shout out to Sister Sharita and Brother Marco for hosting, uh, that wonderful event for us to just be able to go out and fellowship. You can look on our, uh, Facebook channel or our Facebook page and, and check it out. Um, God was doing some marvelous things. Uh, and, and I'm telling you, God is on the move. So many things that are happening here at PWLM. Um, we're also blessing six families, six families that are inside of the ministry. Um, and, and if we run out, then we'll be uh, able to bless those that are outside. But we want to bless those that are a part of this ministry, um, even those that are watching, you know, with some Thanksgiving celebration. So uh, if that's you, get ready. I want you to contact us to Kena. Let her know if you're in this vicinity, in this area, that you need some assistance for Thanksgiving. And we're going to be helping you out with that. With that being said, amen. I love the word. And tonight we're going to be diving in again. Nothing but the truth Bible study. Nothing but the truth Bible study. And we're going to be talking about um, the need for guarding against apostasy. Again, uh, why we can't conform. We can't conform. All right, and, and it's so much in this message um, that I just want to take just a little bit of time. Last week, we talked about um, dealing with understanding the enemy's influence in the body of Christ. And what I mean by that is false teaching um, that is meant to divide. And I spoke um, on, you know, really touched on tattoos. But I want to, I want to clarify something um, for those that were watching and for those that Bishop doesn't have a problem. If you had a tattoo before you got saved, amen. Amen. I'm not speaking against you um, or preaching against you. But my concern is more now uh, for the new generations that are coming out. And we got new preachers and new generations that are coming out that now promote people getting tattoos. And we talked about that last week. We touched on the basis of why. Uh, you know, it's not godly, certain things and instances and where it came from, the history behind it. Um, and I pray that it blessed you. And again, um, if, 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 if you're giving your life to Christ and you have a tattoo, um, you know, before you got saved or before you began your walk, that's fine. Um, but I'm talking about how the enemy is coming in with new ideas now, um, that do not necessarily promote godly Christian living. And, uh, you know, for the majority of the body of Christ, there's a lot of people that are accepting it, um, coming in, but I still believe in standing on the word of God. And so again, uh, we talked about that. If you would like more inf information on that, go back and look at the video. And if you have any questions, tag us in it, let us know that you have questions and we'll try our best to answer that. So with that being said, amen, let's dive in tonight. Um, so again, tonight we're going to be addressing the dangers, the dangers of conforming to the culture of the day. I'm going to say that again. We're going to be addressing um, an apostasy of, you know, the dangers of conforming um, to the culture of the day. And, and, and Christ warned us about it. Paul warned us about it. Um, the word of God warns us about you know, what was coming. So um, the Bible speaks about animity, right? There's an animity, which is a secret or open hatred um, towards God's word, inherently already embedded in the hearts of people. Um, so I want you to understand that. Um, in Romans chapter eight, verse seven and eight, we'll get into that because it deals with the saved and the unsaved, believers and unbelievers. And this Hatred, this, 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 uh, animity, this animity, 
um, that is in the flesh, in the flesh, has literally against God. Let me say this. I've been Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, you know, speaking in tongues. I believe in God, trying to live a holy life before Christ. But my flesh don't like the word no when it comes to what it wants. I don't care how godly we become. We need to understand that there is always going to be a difference in the desire of the flesh and the spirit. Um, we are three-part beings again, body, soul, and spirit. And, and my, my, my soul can be cultivated to desire. This is what the enemy is trying to do when he is uh, attacking. This is when he's trying to persuade, when he's presenting himself as an angel of light. He's literally trying to conform your soul, praise God, to a lifestyle of worldly thinking and, and, and then it conforms your life. So, you know, this is what the apostle said. So let's quickly go and you have your Bibles, Romans chapter eight, verse seven through eight. Again, Romans chapter eight and verse seven through eight. And I'm going to read it from the uh, New Living Translation. It says, for the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. All right. Um, it's speaking of understanding, you know, this, this enemy that is sometimes from within how we are cultivated. This is why I believe in what the word teaches about training up a child, training up a child in the way that they should grow. So when they get old, they will not depart from it because whatever you feed yourself, whatever you feed your children, I spoke to this um, with the young man, however you train, however you are cultivated is what will come out. You can't listen to ungodly stuff, you know, almost 24 seven and then expect to desire to go to church. You can't feed yourself ungodly things and then desire to serve God because it's training you. It's training you, all right? And so this is exactly what he brings out in the passage again that was in the New Living Translation um, if you want me to, what I can do for those that have the King James Bible, I will read it from the King James Bible very quickly. And again, that's Romans chapter eight in verse seven through eight. And it reads this, praise the Lord, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That's that secret and open hatred for it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. So when the mind remains in the carnal state, it cannot be subjected to the laws of God. It, it don't make sense to the, to the carnal mind. You go to church. Why are you going to church? You can go to church at home now. Why you give up your time to go to a building? But people don't say that about going to a football game or going to the mall or going out to party or going out, you know, to do other things. It's only church. I want you to see the great deception of the enemy. People ain't, you know, for the mass objective people in worldly thinking, they're not strategically trying to stop us from going out to fellowship. They don't say, hey, you know, don't go out and grocery shop, man, you can get sick out there. But in the body of Christ... They don't want us to assemble, right? And it comes from a carnal thinking and it cannot be subjected to the laws of God. That's what Romans chapter eight, verse seven says, verse eight. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. They that think carnally, they that are of this mindset cannot please God. So if there's any doubt about understanding the dangers of the culture, um, let me say this. Why do most popular ministers, um, fear is out of being out of sync with the culture. All right. You have a lot of new age preachers and stuff. And the majority of what they preach is, you know, we don't want to be out of sync 
with the culture, all right? Pastors and leaders um, are chasing the culture uh, so that it trends, how it responds, how it, it dresses, all of those things shows up inside of their services. It shows up in inside. And I mean, literally, if you want to know whether people are being seduced by the culture of today, just look at um, their behavior. Look at their actions and all of that thing. You know, when when we wear suits to, to church, first thing people say is, oh, people don't do that no more. If you, you know, are trying to be, you know, monogamous in your relationship, oh, people don't do that no more. If you're trying to sustain yourself until, oh, people don't do that no more. Um... It's an attack against the culture of the kingdom, not necessarily the culture of a church. And so what's happening is uh, the culture of the world is invading the body of Christ so that now there is an attack. And I mean, tremendously an attack, right? But just look at, like I said, if it didn't matter, just look at, how many are trying to stay relevant? That's what we call it now. I want to be relevant to the day um, so that, and I understand the principle of relevance, but let me say this. I don't want to be so relevant that the world is so excited about staying with me, but not changing. There's a difference because we're called to make people change. Our life because the Bible doesn't say just the salt and the, or just doesn't say the light, but it says salt. Salt irritates. Salt is in, is, is an aggression in some manners or, or instances. It is called to change the flavor, change the things, the perspective. And the Bible says if the salt has lost its ability to change, it is then no good for nothing, right? But to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. So we find many leaders, many pastors chasing the culture um, so that its trends show up in their churches. They treat this pool pursuit as a necessary evangelistic strategy. So it's necessary. That's what in most of the meetings um, that I talk about, you know, with people, um, the first thing that people begin to say is it's necessary. It's necessary to look that way because how are we going to reach the world if we dress this way? It's necessary um, to act like that because how will we reach the world if we don't act like that or we don't do this? But again, according to the word of God, our behavior and the way that we conduct ourselves is supposed to be different. The works of the spirit, the works of the flesh, right? Um, so, amen. Praise the Lord, Minister Arcel. Praise the Lord, Sister Abril and Brother Derek. So watch this. We get into this understanding. Um, because not the only way to be in sync with the culture um, of today, the only way to be in sync with the culture of, of, of the generations that are coming is to diminish, I believe, is to diminish the presence of the word of God. Um, because unregenerate cultures will always be fundamentally and irreconcilably incompatible with the truth of God. That means it's like water and oil. I don't care how we try to intertwine it. We try to intermix it. It's not the same. It is not the same. There's no way that the world is the same as the body of Christ. But a new teaching... I believe it's founded in apostasy has arisen in such a way that again, we are chasing the culture, but abandoning the faith. We are chasing the culture all for the need of gain sake or glory or the math to amass numbers and things of that magnitude. But the Bible says, first of all, Wide is the path that leadeth unto destruction, and many there be that find it narrows the path that leadeth unto righteousness. 
and few there be that on it. Why? Why? Because few people are willing to give up their life. Everybody wants to accept Christ. A lot of people that want to accept Christ. But few people are willing to step into the, the space of sanctification, discipleship, which means I got to give up me now. I can't do what I want to do. I can't dress how I want to dress. I can't act how I want to act. All of that stuff I got to give up to follow Christ because that's what he said. If any man comes after me, he must first deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So again, um, I believe that there is a, a reach for the culture. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that there are some people that God has raised up that are designed to go where the traditional church can't go. But I also believe that the body of Christ is to maintain its identity. I'm going to say that again. That means when I go out there to reach them, I don't bring what they are out there into the body of Christ. Amen. Um, again, in the book of Revelations, it's why God had so many things against the church. Because they were allowing the world to affect them. False prophets um, allowing the world. Leave, listen, they, he even said they left their first love to what after these things. And so, um, again, the word of God brings us to this place. So let's let's talk just briefly about conformability because we've been talking about this. And again, I said to guard against apostasy, we can't conform. I'm going to say that again. We have to come out of the place of conforming um, to the world. Now, I believe, again, in, you know, God, that's first of all. And I thank God for some of the, the, the fathers that keep us grounded because I believe without being grounded by the word and by some spiritual fathers, sometimes we have the ability to, to cut loose and do everything. Um, it doesn't mean that we got to sing the songs that they sung back then. We can sing some of those songs, but I believe there's new songs God is giving um, daily to every generation. But I also believe that the songs that God give are about him. They're never about gain sake. They're never about stuff. They're never about us, you know, uh, being worldly. I, I don't believe that that's, that's biblical. That's scriptural. Again, um, I believe it's a part of apostasy that has affected the body of Christ. So Romans chapter 12, let's go there. Romans chapter 12, verse one through two. Amen. And if you have some questions, you can type them. Prayerfully, I'll be able to click back over and see them. Um, that's right. Sometimes salt stings. Uh, and the reality is God is bringing us back to a place. So I, I, I kind of want to bring this, uh, you know, up and, and just read this. So he says, watch, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. How? How should my body be presented to God? Holy, acceptable. That means why would Paul state this if there was not an unacceptable way? Because again, in apostasy and in the generations of today, it's almost as if God just accepts everything. He is the God of acceptance. God accepts everything. But that is not what the word says. We preach so much liberty that again, that's why I posted that statement on the liberties. And I believe they should be guided. These liberties, these freedoms that we have so much and we take advantage of so much, you know, number one, is this going to affect, how will it affect me? That's the first thought I need to have. And then how will it affect those that are around me? Whatever I say that I'm liber at liberty to do, I'm at freedom to, how will it affect me and how will it affect those that are around me? I got to count the cost. I got to look at the consequences because so many times we're just so ready to be free of stuff and we don't even understand it's not our spirit it's our flesh of course my flesh wants to be free it wants to do what it wants to do it don't want to be restricted by the word and yes 
The word will restrict some things. But for our sake. Now, if you don't understand that, that's because we're not there spiritually, mentally yet. But yes, the word is there also to, to create bet so I don't go over there and fall into the temptation. That's why Jesus, even God in the garden, gave them into, don't touch, don't do this, least this comes upon you, least it out. And again, here comes the enemy. There is a counter to everything God says don't do. The enemy comes in and says, did God really mean that? Yeah, he meant what he said. I'm here to tell you what God said about his word, what he said concerning you, what he said concerning me, what he said about don't touch it. He meant it. He didn't mean, well, you know, it's all right. Do it at your own leisure. He didn't mean go to this church and if they do it, it's all right to do it. Again, that's why there were to the seven churches. The angel of God writes these things. I know by works. I know, I know what you're doing. Yes, I see the good things, but this I have against you. So we have to be careful, right? All right. So he says, <laughs> present your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse two, and be not conformed and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I, 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 I want to make sure we get that without the renewed mind. You don't know what's good or what's not good. I don't care if you're going to church without the renewed mind of the word of God. You don't know how to discern what is good and what's not good. This is why so many people are falling into the trap of the enemy because you have so, man, you don't listen to, man, them preachers are just trying to restrict you. Man, they just trying to do that and this. And so it creates a complex where now they don't go seek wisdom because they got the wisdom. They don't go and say, hey, you know what? Um, You know, I read this word. No, most of the time people are telling people, you know, you just study for yourself. But that ain't even scripture. The Bible says, and how can they hear without a preacher? A teacher is necessary. And how can they preach except they be sent? When God sent Philip until the Ethiopian eunuch, what he asked him was, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, no. How can I except someone should guide me? And the truth is, I'm, I'm tired of hearing it. It's a whole bunch of young pastors, young preachers, and, 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 and whatever they want to call themselves apostles, you know, oh, you don't need nobody. It's just God and the Holy Spirit. And that's what's causing a lot of young people. When I say young, I ain't talking about age. I'm talking about some even, I'm talking about young in the spirit of God. You just got saved and, and, and you heard people tell you, don't listen to X, Y, Z. Now people are out. They won't even hear from the word of God. Because you have embedded the wrong spirit and you don't think you're going to be held accountable? Because most people don't know that the Bible gives us a warning. Again, that was one of the causes of the book of Revelations when he wrote to the church because they allowed that, that false prophet is Jezebel to speak and seduce the people out of the way. That's what the scripture teaches. And so we have to do a better job of guarding the flock. All right. So he says again in, in, in Romans chapter 12, verse two, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, 
Hallelujah. Um, I want you to write this down. The opposite of conforming is transformation. The opposite of conforming is transformation. All right, and I pray that we understand that because it's very imperative to understand. The opposite of conforming is transformation. And that happens in the change or renewed mind. And that's not just a one-time deal. Why? Because the enemy is not just trying to conform you one time. He's trying to conform you every day. So how is it that we think that transformation only happens one time? No, the renewing of the mind is a continued process. It has to happen daily. That's why we have to study our word daily. That's why we have to pray daily. That's why we have to seek God daily. Why? Because we are being, we are being bombarded daily by the conforming ways of the world. Whether it's watching television and it's saying, do this, eat this, do that. That's again, I pointed it out by saying, whatever is being deposited into your consciousness will become your subconscious thought. And remember that subconscious thought responds without thought. The subconscious action responds without thought. So you got to understand that the enemy wants to hit you so much that you just start responding without even thinking. You don't even think, what does the word of God say anymore? You just respond. Um, And so many times, you know, because I, I, I heard someone and there are people that are talking about, man, this generation, they're so wise. And But the Bible talks about the wisdom of generations that would come. That because they think they're so wise, they would become fools, right? Because now, you know, we believe whatever we want to. And we accept whatever, we, and we call it God, right? We'll get to that. So we should not, and, I, I'm, and I'm not saying, listen, hear me, hear me, hear me. I'm not saying we should withdraw from the world. For the Bible says that we're in the world. We're designed to be in the world, but not of it, all right? God did not put us in the world and then say, all right, you ain't even supposed to be because there's there's a far right and a far left. There's those that, you know, don't believe in intermingling, don't believe in interaction with the world at all. That's not what I teach. How can we ever be the salt and the light of the earth if all we do is church, religion? I ain't talking about kingdom. I'm talking about religion. But I said this before, God and the kingdom teach that some of us will be carpenters. Some of us will be designers. Some of us will be different things. And your job is not to just grab a mic and preach the word. Sometimes your job is to do hair and tell people about Christ as you're doing hair, to change the oil in that car and tell people about Christ when the opportunity presents itself, right? And so that's kingdom thinking. So we should not withdraw from the world. Rather, we should not be conformed to it. That's what he's saying. Because again, we are the light. So Romans chapter 12, verse 1, 2, 2 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, again, by in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, because this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Do not conform to the shape, the contour uh, of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. In the Amplified Version, it reads this in verse two, and do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs. It says don't follow its superficial values and don't follow its customs but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values, Christian ethics, right? And ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you, because the truth is we cannot approve of God's plan for our life 
when our mind is unregenerate because the way God thinks and the way we think is two different ways. And that's honesty. I listen, I would have never thought my life would turn out the way that it did by God's standard or the way he would. No, I wouldn't have chose to go down that way. Anybody know what I'm talking about? My thinking was, okay, God, you're going to take me through this route right here. It's nice, pretty. I understand it. Amen. I can, I can do this and bless others. I, man, that's the way. But that is not the way God had me to go. And I, you know, the truth is, there are times you will never understand why he does the things he do. Because he doesn't think like us, right? So, again, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul has a don't follow by a do, all right? He has a don't follow by a do, right? And that means he has a don't do this. But do this. Don't conform to the customs or the patterns of the world, but be transformed. That's the do, right? And that word conform uh, comes from the word, I believe, shemaitso. Shemaitso. Um, which means to conform to a pattern, to conform to a shape, to conform to an outline, a contour. It means to basically give off the same vibes, right? We're not supposed to give off the same vibe that the world gives off of. We ain't supposed to feel the same way that the world feels. We ain't supposed to process things like the world processes things. But how, Bishop? By transforming our mind. So that the latter part of the scripture says, so that finally we can know what is good and what the will of God is. How it's good for us in our life. Because without the mind being renewed, we'll never understand it. So again, Shemaitso to form according to a pattern or a mold. All right? I want you to know this. God designed you to be a mold breaker. And that is the, the world mold breaker. He designed you to be different. That's why he says you are a royal priesthood, a set apart people. You ain't meant to look and be and dress and talk and do like the world. We meant to be trendsetters. Come on, I am a trendsetter. I am designed to fall into conformity of the world. The world is supposed to conform to us. So the same term Shemaitso is found in only one other place in the New Testament, and that's 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 14. All right? Shemaitso, the word Shemaitso is only found in one other New Testament passage, and that's in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 14, when he says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust, which was yours in your ignorance. In other words, don't go back to being that person. Don't fall back into that trap of, 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 of being confocused. Again, the enemy's objective is to get you to fall back into who you were before you got changed. He wants you to be that same person. That's why you hear so many people talking about, oh man, if they only knew who I was, man, I, I do. You know, yeah, that's a tactic of the enemy. He wants you to go back to that same behavior. And so many people are falling into the trap. You clubbed. You did all of that stuff before you got saved. How is it that we're going backwards and not forward? And then, again, let me say this. How you know it's the enemy? He will never let you get around people that is going to tell you the truth. I hear people talking about it all the time. Well, you know, I, was, I just... You know, it ain't nothing against you, Bishop. I just, you know, I feel like I don't want to be around you sometimes because, you know, and you don't want to be around me because, you know, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you to come out from that thing. I'm going to tell you, no, that's not good for you. And so, you know, listen, people of light, don't be mad when they don't want you around. They don't want you around because that's what the scripture says will happen. That's how you know you are changed. When you are really changed. We'll get to it in a minute. The Bible says the world will not like you.
Because I got a whole bunch of people that's talking about, well, I don't know why, you know, they don't talk to me or they don't want to be around me or, you know, I don't know why. They, listen, I don't get invited to the parties. I don't get invited to the stuff. And I'm, I'm all right with it. I'm all right with it because if I go, I'm going to feel uncomfortable in the spirit. I, I'm just being honest. And if I'm uncomfortable, I might say something. And I might let you know, hey, listen, maybe the dress was too tight. Or maybe, you know, the pants was too tight, brothers. Or the shirt was too tight. Or, hey, you know, maybe you were doing the wrong thing. We can't do that. And that's why people don't want you there. Hallelujah. Hey, glory. Hallelujah. So, again, Paul and Peter meant to tell the Christians, do not conform to the world. Again, the Christian and the world are not to be like shaped. I shouldn't be. This is why I do believe in certain dress attire and stuff. All right. Why, Bishop? Now, I ain't saying that you got to dress, you know, in a three piece suit, button down, all of that. stuff. So I ain't saying that. But I do believe that there is something that sets aside believers you know, so we come from, we come from the Jews. If you're a Gentile, you come from the Jews. Your faith comes from what it was. All right. I don't see the Jews saying, you know, we, we supposed to wear, typically, you know, when they're going to synagogue, you know, when they're traveling to study. Because they don't look like they're going to a party. They don't. If they're going to the synagogue, they don't look like they're going to the club. They don't look like they're going to a bar. They don't look like they're going out to wherever. They look like they're going to church, to a synagogue. But we of the Christian faith in our liberties, have become so deluded in what we do that literally we show up sometimes to the house of God. And I'm not talking about new converts. I'm talking about should be becoming of saints. I'm talking about been saved for a while, filled with the Holy Ghost for a while, but you dress like you're going to a party. And when the unsaved come in, they're not challenged to change because we look like them, we talk like them, we dress like them, we act like them, and that is the conformity that they were talking about. And be not conformed. Again, this ain't me preaching against new converts. I'm talking about some of you saints that's been in, in, in the gospel for a while. And, you know, it's just what, well, you know. And so we conform to the culture of today versus living the standard of what it means to be saved. You know the importance of how we dress. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. It used to be, used to be, when you put on that suit, people knew where you were going. Because they didn't just wear suits everywhere. When you put on that suit, they knew you were going to church. They knew you were going to the house of God. It spoke about, you didn't have to say, I'm a Christian. Because your dress attire said it for you. All right. A police officer doesn't have to say, Police stop if he's wearing his uniform because the uniform says I am an officer of the law. Do you get it? A doctor, a nurse, a physician, whatever you want. They don't have to say I work in a hospital if they wear their scrubs. It automatically indicates their profession. So why do we? As the body of Christ think that we can dress any old type of way 
and it sends the message to the world. Amen. About our identity. So this is why, pay attention, it's easy for Kanye West to fit in with the body now. It's easy for a Beyonce to fit in with the body now. It's easy for, you know, any ungodly person to fit in because we look like they do. We dress like they do. We do the same things that they do. So why, why are we making the enemy's job so much easier? <laughs> Amen. So be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So again, we should not allow ourselves to be pressed into the into following the corrupt customs, ungodly principles, or evil plans of actions promoted by worldly people. Psalms 1 and 1, right? Psalms chapter 1, verse 1. Psalms 1 and 1. Let me go there. Why, why watch this? Let's see what the psalmist had to say. All right. Watch. I love it. I love it. I love it. Psalms 1 and 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the wisdom in the counsel, in the sayings, in the teachings of the ungodly. Blessed is that man. Nor what? Come on, amen. Some of y'all should know the scripture by now. Nor what? Uh-huh. I just wanted to get this in New Living Translation. Nor sit it or, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But, verse 2, I love it. His delight, his desire is in the law of his God, his Lord. And in his law, Doth he meditate? He's transformed day and night. All right. And he shall be planted by, and he shall be planted like a tree planted by the rivers of water. So no matter what comes his way, he won't be moved. Now, in the New Living Translation, praise the Lord, it says, All the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. Or stand around with sinners. Or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord. Meditating on it day and night. Oh, the joys. Blessed is he. All right. So watch, 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 watch. Because we know what that word bless means. So. He says, blessed is the man, according to Psalms 1 and 1, that resists being conformed to the pattern of this world. He will not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. I'm not aligning myself with the wicked. I didn't say that I can't be a witness to them, but we ain't just going to go out and, and hang out and and, and, and do a, yes, I understand what Christ did. But let me say this to you. Christ was mature enough to handle it and not change. Some of us ain't there yet. Until you are mature enough to go out with folk and not change because you are around them, do what the scripture says. Come out from among them. Be Separate. 
Because God don't want you there, lest you fall into the snare of the trap of the enemy. So you got to know, and this is why I, listen, I love the word of God and I be, I don't mind talking to folk. You know, you falling back because you, you start hanging out with the same people you used to hang out with. I get it all the time. Well, you know, I just don't know, Bishop, why, you know, I, I really want to come to church. I just don't know what's stopping me. What's stopping you is who you hanging out with and what you're doing. If I hung out with somebody that was bitter about church, eventually I would stop going to church because they bitter and their bitterness is going to rub off on me. Amen, Brother James. And the reality, the reality is that, you know, sometimes we don't want to agitate. We don't want to be the salt. We don't want to be the light, right? So by catering to the unchurched or to the uncovered, un unconverted in the church, evangelic evangelicalism has been hijacked by legions of carnal preachers Seeking to convince the world that Christians can be just as inclusive, pluralistic, and open-minded as any postmodern, politically correct, worldly person. And that's the truth. Man, we just like you. Amen. Praise God. We can do, man, you know, and listen, living saved really isn't boring. But I'm not going to go have an affair so I can prove to somebody that living for Jesus, he, he can forgive folks. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go out there and do something ungodly so I can prove that God is a merciful God. The Bible says, why do that? Why tempt God by, by embracing that sin? That grace can abound. Why? God did not make us into that place. But again, this is what we do, right? So, Again, true biblical Christianity requires a denial of every worldly value and behavior. And Christians must be willing to make a commitment to the word of God with a full understanding of the implications of doing so. Understand that if I choose to go down this path, it's going to cost me. I love Jesus. I do. Because as you read Christ, he did not give them false falsities like most of the churches do now. Oh, you know. Living for Jesus, once you get saved, it's just a bed of roses. You're never going to do nothing. God is always fighting for you. You'll never lose. All of that stuff. When the reality is, let me tell you something. The moment that you make up your mind to serve God, that's when the real battle begins. Can anybody be a witness but me? The moment you truly make up your mind of past, all hell going to break loose. The moment you make up your mind to forgive, the devil is coming at you with everything he got. The moment that you make up your mind to be transformed, mm -mm, I'm bringing every hellion, every demon, everything I can do to make you change your mind, right? So Jesus plainly tells the disciples in John chapter 15 and verse 19, watch this. John chapter 15 and verse 19. All right, that's St. John, not 1st John. All right. After Jesus speaks about him being the vine, the true vine, in verse 18, he says, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. 19. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it. That means if you were like them, they would love you. But you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. All right. So he spoke and he says that the world will hate them because they are not of the world. Right. God has chosen believers out of the world and the world hates them. That's where the hatred comes from. B 
Because we won't conform. Amen. Because I won't do. I won't agree with. I won't. Listen. I don't care if folk write me off. Do whatever you got to do. I understand that I'm trying to make it in. Period. And I will not let nothing stop me from making it into the kingdom of God. Making it into, I won't let nothing and this is where the enemy comes in. He comes in with deceit because, again, his objective is he knows that time is short, right? So the word of God not only says that they will hate you, right? Luke chapter 6, verse 26. Jesus says, woe to you. Man, hallelujah. I, I love the word. Let's go to Luke. Luke is before John. Luke chapter 6, verse 26. Watch what Jesus says. Uh-huh. Verse 26. Jesus says, Woe to you when all men speak well of you. But their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. And I love what he says, when all men, he didn't say the believer. Believers are supposed to speak well. But he said, woe to you when all men speak well of you. When, oh, you know, man, you know, the stuff you do, you know, amen. Luke chapter 6, verse 26, not 36. Luke chapter 6, verse 26. Thank you, Minister Ursel. PWLM changed Luke chapter 6, verse 36 to 26. All right. So, woe to you. What sorrow awaits you who are praised by the crowds? For their ancestors also praised false prophets. He said, man, you better understand. Woe. Woe to you. Because that's how they treated the false prophets, right? So why is the world so fixed in its animosity toward the truth of God? Jesus says in John chapter 7 and verse 7, The world hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. Jesus said plainly, I'm telling them if they're not living right, they're not living right. I'm telling the world that their deeds are evil. That's why they don't like me. Anytime you tell people the truth, I don't care who you are, you ain't going to be like, period. And you just got to be all right with it. Because the world is not here to be our friend. That's why the scripture says that anybody that is a friend of the world, and when it says that, it's not talking about being nice to folk, being cordial to folk. It's talking about loving what they love, doing what they do. Anybody that follows that path is an enemy against God. I cannot love God and love the ways of the world. Can't do it. Right? Right? Mm -hmm. He says, they hate me because I testify of their evil deeds. So contempt for scripture is not intellectual. It's moral. I'm going to say that again. The contempt that people have for scripture is not intellectual. A lot, it's moral. I, they just don't like it because it's going to change who I am. It ain't going to allow me to do what I want to do. So it's a moral thing. And Jesus explained to Nicodemus, men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. John chapter 3, verse 19. He said, that's what's happening. And, and I really believe that that's where a lot of people are headed now. We love the darkness more than we love the light. The light represents truth. It represents change. This is why the false apostles and the false prophets and the false teachers have these huge churches. 
because as long as I can go and do whatever I want to do and feel like I'm serving God and I ain't got to change, all right, amen. But the moment that I, I feel like I got to change, now I don't think I should be a part of this church no more. Tell me something else. Tell me how I can obtain the car, the house, the loan. Tell me how I can do all of these things. But yet the scripture says it is better to not enter into heaven with everything than it is to enter into heaven, you know, into hell with everything. It's better to enter into heaven maimed than it is to enter into heaven or hell with all of your stuff, right? So the reality is God is literally calling us away, all right? So how tragic for the church to seek to accommodate that worldly affection since it is impossible by any human method to overcome the sinner's resistance to the truth and the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 14. And again, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 14. For the sake of time, we're getting ready to close. Watch. But the people's minds were hardened. And to this day, whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds. So they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. That's it. Only by not going to church, not being on the praise and worship team, not being on the choir, not reading scripture, not being the usher, not being the musician. He says the only way it can change is by believing in Christ. And that's the question. Do you really believe him? Do you believe what he said? So he's calling us out of the place of apostasy. So again, the only time the church has made any spiritual impact on the world is when the people of God have stood firm and have refused to compromise, boldly proclaiming the truth in the face of the world's hostility. In, in the end, seeking cultural relevance will only result in obsolescence, since tomorrow's generation will inev inevitably renounce today's fads and philosophies. And I'll say that again. What, what's popular now won't be popular then. I know it's, it's kind of, you know, mind blowing, but I tell my son all the time that some of the stuff they do, do we did. Um, but you know, the reason they do the stuff that they do now is because it's a different time frame. They don't dress like we dress. They don't, you know, do stuff that we used to do, but we train them according to the word. So in the, in the face of ever-changing cultural trends, the church needs to boldly proclaim the eternal relevance and evergreen applicably of the word of God. People may believe or disbelieve the Bible, but no one has the power or the prerogative to establish truth or to change it. It is fixed. Once for all, the word of God is settled forever in heaven. And it's profoundly essential, all right? So um, in that, I, I really wanted to just read this scripture because, you know, I, I said that there is a generation um, and, and, and I had a very great conversation with a lot of young men. And the reason why I'm finding out that, you know, they don't want to change or is because they've never been told the truth. And that's one of the things that we've come to understand. Literally have never been told the truth. Like, yes, it does. History does repeat itself. And literally, I'm finding that they didn't have people that taught them about God, taught them about the word, taught them. And so now God is raising up people that will go and again and talk to the young people. When I went and I sat down with these young men, I didn't dress in a suit. I didn't put on you know, all of this stuff, but I didn't dress like a hoodlum or thug. I didn't sag my pants and say, hey, you know, let me go be now. No, I dressed it comfortably and I went and I ministered. I talked to him, right? So watch this because we're talking about 
this 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 generation of wisdom that they believe they have come to the point, right? The Bible says, for the invisible things, Romans chapter 1, verse 20 through 27, are through, yeah, 27, all right? We'll go that far. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. That means Lord. When he says God there, it's translated Lord. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their hearts, their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Well, you know, God don't, he ain't, he ain't like that. You know, I, I stated this before. If you ever really want to know God, you got to understand the characteristics of God. God is not just a God of grace and mercy. He's also a jealous God. He's also a vengeful God. All of that scripture. But it seems like we only, the Bible says he's a terrible God. We only focus on this loving God that just flowers and roses. He never wants to eradicate sin. He just loves everybody. Even in the midst of our most heinous rebellion. He's, you know, God, you know, and we say it in, in God. He's just this God of acceptance. Because that's more palatable than to tell somebody, come out from there. Don't do that. Change. Let God transform your mind. All right. Gold nugget. Gold nugget. We're closing. Gold nugget. The reason you cannot change is because you've been trying to change physically. You can't change physically if you don't change mentally first. Again, that's why the scripture says that there must be a renewing of the mind. And just as I stated if you're only being bombarded on Saturday, then feel free to only grow on Saturday. But if you are being bombarded by the enemy daily, then why do we think that the only time we need to renew our mind is on the Sabbath or on Sunday? No, every day is a day to renew your mind. I renew my mind more than once a day because I don't want the enemy to gain victory. So again, the question is, are you conforming? Are you bringing God and his word to a spiritual truth? Are you causing people to come out of darkness? That's why he's transforming you. Not to take on the, the contour, the shape of the world, but to be different. Amen? I want to say thank you again for tuning in and being with us today. God is calling you higher. He's calling you to a place of change. And I believe that. I believe that he's going to do something great in your life. Do not allow the enemy to, to cause you to step into a place of compromise. But be changed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for the faithful, for those, God, that have got cleaved unto your word. No matter what's going on in their life, they realize how much we need you. For in myself, I can do nothing, but with you, I can do all things. That's why your word declares, I can do all things through Christ that gives me the strength. Break the chains and destroy the bands of wickedness. Undo the heavy burden, set the captive free and bring revelation and wisdom and light. And we will forever be mindful to give you the glory, honor and the praise. Heal God tonight. Heal the bodies of those with infirmities. And we thank you for it right now. In Jesus mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Listen, this is Bishop James Manning. I love you.
thank you for tuning in. Like, share the video. Let's worship as we go out. Come on. You don't want to miss this Sabbath. We're going to have a hot time in the Lord. Invite somebody to come out with you. And I look forward to seeing you there. Greet each other. They don't just hop off. Greet each other. If you need salvation, if you need to reach out, we have ministers that are online, online right now. Also, you can contact us through our messenger and we will respond. Hallelujah. We love you and I'll see you next time. And be gracious to you. Come on. And Can somebody type amen? Hey. Lord, Come on, we leave this blessing with you tonight. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, face toward you and Come on, we receive it tonight. We declare the blessings of God over your life. Come on, in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody type, I receive it. I receive it. Hey. Be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and your children and your children. May you pray be upon you and a thousand generations. Thank you.